Welcome, my name is Dr. Kim Conley and it's my pleasure to present to you the 2018 Diabetes Canada Clinical Practice Guideline Update with the chapter focusing on treatment of diabetes in people with heart failure. I would like to acknowledge the hard work of my co-authors, Professor Richard Gilbert and Professor Peter Liu. Key changes in the 2018 heart failure update include new information on the use of DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists in people with type 2 diabetes and heart failure. We'll discuss the role of SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with established cardiovascular disease to reduce heart failure hospitalization and discuss the role of Secubitril Valsartan combination therapy in patients with heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction known as HEFREF, typically defined as an ejection fraction less than 40%. When considering the checklist in patients with diabetes and heart failure, the following should be considered. Firstly, treat heart failure in people with diabetes the same as you would a person without diabetes. Two, metformin therapy is recommended if the estimated glomerular filtration rate is greater than 30 mL per minute per meter squared. Three, if the estimated glomerular filtration rate or EGFR is less than 60 mL per minute, one can use renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system antagonists or secubitril valsartan combination therapy but please do so carefully. Four, do not use the class of agents known as thiazolidine diones. And finally, avoid saxagliptin in patients with heart failure and diabetes. Diabetes is a well-described cause of heart failure. Importantly, approximately 40% of all heart failure hospitalizations are as a result of diabetes. Now, the commonest cause of heart failure in patients with diabetes is underlying ischemic heart disease. However, there is a condition known as diabetic cardiomyopathy, which occurs independent of underlying ischemic heart disease and is associated with asymptomatic abnormalities of ventricular systolic and diastolic function. When one considers risk factors for the development of heart failure, these include an elevated A1C and albuminuria. Most importantly, however, the diagnosis of diabetic cardiomyopathy is a diagnosis of exclusion, and tests should be performed to ensure that ischemic heart disease has been ruled out. When considering therapies for patients with diabetes and heart failure, one should use the same heart failure therapies in people with diabetes as would be considered in people without diabetes. This recommendation is based on the Canadian Cardiovascular Society Heart Failure Recommendations, www.ccsguidelineprograms.ca. When treating patients with type 2 diabetes and heart failure, one should use the same treatments as in people without diabetes, and this includes beta blockers, for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or systolic heart failure, that is an ejection fraction less than 40% if indicated, and one should target the same drug doses indicated by the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. Where the estimated glomerular filtration rate or EGFR is less than 60 mL per minute per meter squared, then starting doses of ACE inhibitors or angiotensin II receptor blockers should be halved with gradual up titration, and one should monitor electrolytes, creatinine, and blood pressure and weight within seven to 10 days of starting or up titration. Below is data presented from the Paradigm HF trial. This was a trial of approximately 8,300 individuals who had heart failure with reduced ejection fraction 
on evidence-based therapies. Patients were randomized to receive either the ACE inhibitor in Alapril or the combined neprilysin inhibitor angiotensin II receptor blocker Secubitril Valsartan or LCZ696. As can be seen by the four graphs below, the combination therapy with LCZ696 significantly reduced major adverse cardiac events, cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalization, or all-cause mortality. Importantly, 34% of patients enrolled in the trial had a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, and similar benefits were observed in the diabetic subgroup. As a result, this therapy is recommended for use in heart failure patients with reduced ejection fraction if clinically indicated. Next, we will focus upon antihyperglycemic therapy in patients with diabetes who have heart failure. Metformin has been typically considered the first line agent in the use of diabetes. However, in chronic heart failure, there was concerns that it should be contraindicated, although there's significant evidence suggesting that it may actually be beneficial. In this study, which looked at approximately 422 subjects out of the population of Tayside, Scotland, which comprises around 400,000 people. There were 422 su study subjects who developed incident heart failure with type 2 diabetes between the years 1994 to 2003 who were receiving antihyperglycemic therapies. Of these 422 study subjects, 68 were taking metformin monotherapy, 217 were taking sulfonylurea monotherapy, and 137 were taking combination therapy. As the chart on the right demonstrates, there were significantly fewer deaths in subjects taking metformin, either alone or in combina combination with sulfonylureas, when compared to those taking sulfonylurea monotherapy. A second study looking at metformin use in heart failure patients was performed in a cohort of 6,185 ambulatory patients with diabetes and established heart failure, of which 1,561 or 25.2% of patients were treated with metformin. At two years of follow-up, in the patients receiving metformin, there were 246 deaths or 15.8% deaths compared to 1,177 deaths or 25.5% of deaths amongst those not receiving metformin. In the propensity score matched analysis, there were 16.1% of deaths among patients receiving metformin compared with 19.8% of deaths amongst those not receiving metformin. As a result of such data, the 2018 Heart Failure and Diabetes Clinical Practice Guidelines recommend the use of metformin in heart failure patients when the EGFR is greater than 30 mL per minute per meter squared. DPP-4 inhibitors have been studied for cardiovascular outcomes. Three clinical trials, the EXAMIN trial examining the DPP-4 inhibitor alogliptin for cardiovascular safety, saxagliptin was studied in the SAVER TIMI-53 trial for cardiovascular safety, and citagliptin was studied in the TCOS trial for cardiovascular safety. Importantly, all three agents met the pre-specified cardiovascular safety outcomes, but did not demonstrate superiority. In the SAVER TIMI-53 trial, there was a 27% increased risk of heart failure hospitalization, which was statistically significant. As a result, saxagliptin should be avoided in patients with pre-existing heart failure and renal dysfunction. Next, we'll assess the impact 
of the SGLT2 inhibitor in pagliflozin. This drug was studied as part of the cardiovascular outcome trial, the EMPA-REG trial of approximately 7,000 individuals. Here, we look at the endpoint of hospitalization for heart failure. Note the curves separate early and continue to diverge as time continues within the trial. Overall, there was a highly statistically significant 35% reduction in favor of impegliflozin compared to placebo. Similarly, the SGLT2 inhibitor canagliflozin was studied in the CANVAS trial. Here we see the endpoint of hospitalization for heart failure. Note a 33% reduction in favor of canagliflozin with curves beginning to separate by approximately three to six months with continuing divergence across time as the trial progressed. Of note, the trial did not meet its pre-specified endpoint of reaching all-cause mortality reduction, and hence this endpoint is considered exploratory. Recommendation number one for the 2018 Heart Failure and Diabetes Clinical Practice Guidelines. Individuals with diabetes and heart failure should receive the same heart failure therapies as those identified in the evidence-based Canadian Cardiovascular Society heart failure recommendations. Recommendation number two, unless contraindicated, metformin may be used in people with type 2 diabetes and heart failure. Metformin should be temporarily withheld if renal function acutely worsens and should be discontinued if renal function significantly and chronically worsens to an estimated glomerular filtration rate less than 30 mils per minute per meter squared. Recommendation number three. For people with New York Heart Association class one to four heart failure, exposure to TZDs or thiazolidine diones should be avoided. Recommendation four. Beta blockers should be prescribed when indicated for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction as they provide similar benefits in people with or without diabetes. Recommendation number five, in adults with type two diabetes with clinical cardiovascular disease in whom glycemic targets are not achieved with existing anti-hyperglycemic medications and with an EGFR greater than 30 mil per minute per meter squared, an SGLT2 inhibitor with demonstrated heart failure hospitalization reduction may be added to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization. Grade B level 2 for empagliflozin, grade C level 2 for canagliflozin. Recommendation number 6. In people with diabetes and heart failure with an EGFR less than 60 mil per minute per meter squared, and or if combined renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system blockade is employed, starting doses of ACE inhibitors or angiotensin II receptor blockers should be halved. Serum electrolytes, creatinine, blood pressure, body weight, as well as heart failure symptoms and signs should be monitored within seven to 10 days of any initiation or up titration of therapy and Dose up titration should be more gradual with monitoring of blood pressure, serum potassium, and creatinine. Key messages for the 2018 Heart Failure and Diabetes Clinical Practice Guidelines include Heart failure is still underrecognized and misdiagnosed. This has significant clinical implications as the prognosis of untreated or undertreated heart failure is poor and very effective proven therapies are widely avail available for most people. Diabetes can cause heart failure independent of ischemic heart disease, a condition known as diabetic cardiomyopathy, and this may manifest in the setting of normal 
or a reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. The incidence of heart failure is two to fourfold higher in people with diabetes compared to those without and when present occurs at an earlier age. Even though heart failure in people with diabetes should be treated similarly to heart failure in those without diabetes, people with diabetes are less likely to receive evidence-based appropriate therapies. The presence of diabetes should not affect the decision for the treatment of heart failure. Importantly, comorbidities such as renal dysfunction and the propensity for hyperkalemia are more prevalent in people with diabetes and this may influence heart failure drug doses and monitoring of therapy, but not the therapeutic targets. Key messages for those people with diabetes. One, heart failure is a type of heart disease in which the heart no longer pumps sufficient blood to meet the body's needs. Diabetes is an important risk factor for heart failure. Two, symptoms of heart failure include shortness of breath, persistent coughing, fatigue, chest pain, weight gain, or swelling of the feet, ankles, and legs. Three, a number of effective drug treatments are available to keep heart failure in check. Your healthcare provider will discuss these with you. Four, certain glucose lowering medications have the potential to worsen, or more importantly, help heart failure. If you have heart failure, this will influence which glucose lowering medications your healthcare provider selects for you. For further information, please visit guidelines.diabetes.ca for a comprehensive overview of diabetes care. Or download the app which is available at Google Play or the App Store available from Apple. Further information on the Diabetes Canada Clinical Practice Guidelines is available from www.guidelines.diabetes.ca for healthcare providers, or you can call 1-800-BANTING or 1-800-226 8464, or for people with diabetes, you can access www.diabetes.ca.